Hello and welcome to Freedom Watch, your daily dose of raw liberty online at foxnews.com slash Freedom Watch. I'm Judge Andrew Napolitano here defending freedom, defending your natural rights, and defending your right to have a government that stays within the confines of the Constitution. Taxes have been a point of tension between the government and the people since before the founding of the nation. The Constitution originally prohibited the feds from collecting income taxes from individuals. Thus, for 150 years, federal income taxes were unconstitutional. During Lincoln's regime, Congress imposed an income tax to finance the Civil War. It was declared unconstitutional, but the government got to keep the money it collected. The adoption of the 16th Amendment in 1913 let the feds lawfully, or at least constitutionally, tax our personal incomes. At that time, the tax rate was 2% and it was only applied to those who earned more than $10,000 annually, about a quarter of a million today. During the FDR regime, tax rates reached over 80%. Today, the top federal rate is 39%, and that's just, of course, on the federal level alone. In the years before 1913, the federal government, even during wartime, survived on land sales, user fees, duties paid at federal ports, which is a form of a user fee, and assessments imposed on the states for services that the federal government rendered to the states. Today, however, the feds act like individual taxpayers are a bottomless pit of cash. The tax code has 40,000 sections in it. It is not well understood by even the brightest among us and it is really intended to redistribute wealth and control individual behavior by punishing and rewarding financial decisions. Once the feds got their hands on our personal income, they began spending at astronomical rates. Since 1913, same year the Federal Reserve came into existence, the value of the dollar has been reduced by 92%, and the feds have amassed a debt of $14 trillion. There are three ways to accumulate wealth. The inheritance model takes place when an ancestor or benefactor leaves you a gift. The economic model involves trading property, labor, goods, knowledge, or skills for income. The mafia model demands your money or your life or your freedom. Question, which model does the federal government follow? Do you know anyone who comes home after a hard week's work and looks at his pay stub and thinks, you know what? I didn't give the feds enough money this week. Joining me now is David Bowes, the executive vice president of the Cato Institute. David, it's a pleasure. Welcome back to Freedom Watch. Good afternoon. Seems we go through this every year around April 15th. People like you and I who believe that the fruit of our labor is our personal property bemoan taxes, bemoan the government's claim to a portion of our property as if it was theirs and not ours and nothing changes. Taxes go up, spending increases. Is, is this hopeless? Do I own the fruit of my labor or does the government own it? Well, I don't think it's hopeless. There's always a chance to change things in a, in a relatively democratic system, uh, but it's certainly true that government's claim on our incomes has tended to get bigger and bigger. You're right, 1913 was a terrible year for liberty, and I think it was 1914 we got the first federal drug laws, so that was definitely a bad session of Congress. What we're seeing right now, of course, is tax rates about to go up, especially on the most productive individuals in society. Uh, we're going to go back to the tax rates of the 1990s. Uh, then we're going to add on through this health care bill some new taxes on investment income. Uh, we're going to raise the Medicare tax, not because anybody's going to get more money from Medicare, but just because the whole system is going bankrupt. And all of this does, in fact, go back to the income tax and particularly the withholding tax. Because if it weren't for withholding, they couldn't do this. If they sent you a bill for $6,000 or $16,000 or $50,000 at the end of the year, People just wouldn't pay it. It's only because they've got the money out of your pocket before it ever gets into your pocket that they can get away with this and, level and, of taxing and, and spending. Who, and who was that young PhD, that graduate of Rutgers University, that future Nobel Prize in economics winner who was a clerk in the Treasury Department that suggested they try withholding right around World War II? 
Would that have been? Well, there the were several. There were several <laughs> bright young economists in the Treasury Department then, but certainly one of them was Milton Friedman, uh, who understood that the government needed this, uh, in, in, in his perspective, to fight a war. Um, in retrospect, it looks very different. It sure does. I mean, tax rate of 2% in 1913 and 39% now. And, of course, depending upon where you live, like New Jersey, where I do, where we have the highest state income tax and the highest property taxes in the union, it is not uncommon for a middle-class family to be paying nearly 50% of what they earn to a government of some sort. But taking a step back and looking at this just from the point of view of, of freedom, from I own my body and I, and I own what my body produces, does anybody in the government outside of a, maybe a dozen or so libertarians in the House of Representatives really believe that? Or do people in the federal government think that they can raise rates to whatever number they want, the American people like sheep will continue to pay it, that the government can claim title to virtually anything we have, own, or produce, whether it ends up being economically good or economically bad in the long run? Well, uh, they clearly think they have the right and the power and the authority to do that. But I think it's fair to say that if they thought they could get away with it politically and economically, they would raise rates to 50 percent, 75 percent, 90 percent. They So I think there is an understanding that there didn't used to be that there are some costs to raising taxes, that if you raise taxes, you might even get less revenue. You certainly will get less economic output. Now, that understanding is not as strong as it should be. It's not as widespread as it should be. But something is holding them back from raising rates to 50 or 75 percent. And part of it is the politics. They know that, that the public would be very upset. But part of it, I think, is the economics, that there's more understanding of the supply side of the economy than there used to be. We're chatting with David Bose, who's the executive vice president uh, of the Cato Institute, and we're talking about taxes. Uh, two things I want to raise. One, a statistic that came out just a few days ago showing that approximately 47 percent of American households pay no federal income tax. Do you see a danger, a political danger, when half the country doesn't pay taxes but could still send to Washington those who would raise taxes on the other half. Second side of this question is, which is more likely to produce a reduction in tax rates? A realization of basic economics 101, that taxing the rich will cause more unemployment and less investment, or a political upheaval where everybody just says enough is enough? Well, all these things are tied together. Yes, I think it's a problem that half the public doesn't pay federal income taxes. Now, we should remember, they pay Social Security taxes if they're working at all. They pay Medicare taxes. They pay sales taxes. They may pay property taxes. It's not like they're untaxed. But on the federal income tax, it's true that if you've got half the public not paying, it makes it awfully easy for them to just go along with, yeah, yeah, we need more tax revenue to pay for all these things the government is giving us. So I do think that's a problem in a democracy. The idea, the theory in a democracy, or better yet, a republic, is that we will make decisions about governing ourselves. And if half the people can vote without bearing, at least directly, the costs of how they vote, then that's a real problem. And the second part of your question, clearly it is politics that is the most important thing in holding down tax rates. When the public gets angry, like they did in the mid-1970s, like they did in 1980, um, that's when you're more likely to get a tax reduction. However, there's a value to having an understanding of the economic costs. That does cause some members of Congress and some members of the public to say, yeah, it's not just that I'm feeling overtaxed. Here's an economic analysis that says it's actually bad for the country. So those things play together, and Ronald Reagan understood that. He had economists talking about the economic costs right. of the taxes, even at the same time that he was appealing to the voters. Before I let you go, put on your, your real strong libertarian cap. Do you agree with me that taxation is theft? Do you buy that argument? I believe that in, in <laughs> at least in an ideal world, we would not have the initiation of force. And clearly, taxation is the taking of money by force. And so, yeah, I think you want to work toward a world where you don't have coercion.
Great answer. David Bose from the Cato Institute. Always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.